So I just got here in Homestead, Florida at Silver Chrome Gardens. It's basically the commercial operation of Bill Rodolante. And we are going to see a little bit of what he's growing. And I heard he has a really kick-ass private collection, which maybe we'll get to see. But first, we want to go see his commercial operation. Hello. Hi guys. Welcome to Silver going? Chrome Gardens. Yeah, thank you. Who are all these guys? Uh, that's oh. Boomer. This Hi, is Boomer. Daisy and this is Megan. Hi Megan, how are you? I'm assuming these are the uh, the guard dogs. They're my protectors. <laughs> nice to meet you guys. Well, I'd love to see your collection here if you give us a little bit of a tour. No problem. Bill has six greenhouses, and though he grows a range of plants, he's mostly known for his aeroids like anthuriums, philodendron, and alocasia, as well as harder to find plants in the Marantesii, or prayer plant family, like stramanthi, triportia, and calathea. Bill took over the greenhouses two years ago from his father, who started the business back in 1983. He still comes to work every day so he can uh, sit in the office and pay bills, but that's about all he does. So I'm in charge of going out in the nursery and fixing everything, growing everything, making sure everything is perfect. And what did your dad grow in the beginning? Was it also aeroids or what, what did he start with in the 80s? Uh, when he started, he was growing lots of spath. Okay. Um, he was doing uh, syngoniums, mostly bread and butter material. Yeah. But then he started uh, specializing in more of the unusual because it's really hard in the industry to do everything everyone else is doing because they always undercut you on price. Right. The thing is to do something that no one else is doing. And once you start doing that, you get a name for yourself, then things start rolling from there. So how has it worked for you since you specialize in a lot of aeroids? So you, when I think of you, I think of like anthuriums, I think of alocasia. How has it changed now that there's been a little bit more of an aeroid craze? Well, Instagram has hit us like a big pile of bricks. <laughs> And it's made things a lot different than it was before. Yeah. And right now, end user is clamoring for things. Where before, the garden centers would decide what the end user wanted, mm -hmm. and they, that's what they supply. Right. Now with Instagram, everybody knows what they want in advance, and they're ordering it specifically for that reason. Right. Not walking into a garden center, oh, that's pretty, this is pretty. They're seeing it on their friend's feed, they're seeing it somewhere else. Um, they're seeing it on YouTube and they're deciding, hey, this is what I need. I need to find someone who has it, which has made the internet companies that sell on the internet so much more profitable. Right. So, it, and you're really a, a B2B, a business to business, right? So you are growing out your plants here and you're selling them to other businesses like garden centers, yeah. florist shops, interior scapers, landscapers. Um, we have one customer that sells on Amazon. And so I guess my question then is, if you see the you know, influx of the end user clambering for interesting plants, are your nurseries and are your buyers coming back to you saying like, well, what else do you have? Or can I get something even more unique than what you have? Yes, they're always trying to do that. That's why we're always trying to freshen our lineup, add new things. If something's not selling, we take it away, add something else trying to get to that sweet spot where we know it's going to sell all the time. Awesome. Well, maybe as we start to look around the area, you could point out some of those new things that you think people are asking for. OK. So this is a really colorful part of your nursery. Yes, calatheas have become very, very popular because of their beautiful colors and the fact that they're easy to grow in some circumstances, if you have the right environment. What is the right environment? Because I know it's something that like, people come into a garden center or nursery, they fall in love with them because, as you said, the colorful, they're colorful, they have beautiful markings, but people get them in their house and then they feel challenged. They don't like fluoride, they don't like chlorine, they like, don't like bromine. City water is a no-no. Yeah. So if you can use well water, if you can use reclaimed rainwater, if you can use um, 
I have people collecting water from their air conditioning units and yep. using it on them. If you can keep all those chemicals and high salts out of the water, they do great. As long as you have a good amount of humidity, you can't dry them out um, as far as uh, you put them in an office building with no humidity whatsoever, you're going to see some burned edges on mm -hmm. them. So how do you treat them differently in this greenhouse versus if you were growing them elsewhere? Is this um, a different treatment altogether or? Well, we have well water. We don't use any city water so that we don't have to worry about the chemicals in our, in our water. Um, the one thing you do have to worry about is we, this house is on a predator system for spider mites. So we use uh, predatory uh, mites to kill all the spider mites. And that's the one thing we do differently on them because we don't like to spray with harsh chemicals. So we'd rather use mother nature's way of getting rid of the mm -hmm. pests. So use biological insects, like yes. just, or not insects, but bi bi um, biological uh, controls mm -hmm. using predatory mites. What is, do you know the specific predatory mite that you use? Because I know there's different ones we given different. We use the different... Californicus in this house. Okay. We have used Persimilis in the past. Okay, because sometimes the temperature and the humidity levels will even increase or decrease their effectiveness. Uh, the Californicus lasts a little bit longer. Uh, per persimilis are a little bit more voracious. Mm -hmm. So if you have to knock something down right away, Persimilis is good. But if this house, we, we resupply every three, three weeks. So that's fine because they keep everything dead in here for three weeks at a time. So then let's take, let's go through some of these because I'd like to not like overlook them. And of course you have something that's not Marantas or Calatheas here. Mm -hmm. This is a jungle cactus, isn't it? Yes. That's a hooker eye. Beautiful white flowers when they do bloom. This one flowered overnight, so it's already started to wilt. And these are called queen of the night cacti, right? Yes, because yeah. the big flowers at nighttime. Right, so you have to be out here at night in order to be able to see them flower. Or early in the morning when okay. you, you come. They're still a little open. <laughs> and then you have some Calathea zebrinas here. That one has a beautiful royal blue flower when it gets... It's royal blue? It's like a purplish royal oh, blue wow. color. Is it, does it come off on a stalk or? No, it's at the base of the plant. Oh, okay. So but it's one of the more pretty colors okay. of any Calathea out there. So it's like, um, I don't see the this one, but the Rufa Barba, the Rufa one. Rufa Barba has a the yellow, yellow one, at but the that's base. at the yeah. base, right? Okay. So similar then it gets it at the base. Mm -hmm. I always love the, the texture of these too. They don't have the colorful bottoms, but they have a really beautiful texture. And obviously that flower, I have never seen them in bloom. Uh, yeah, it needs to be a good size to start blooming. Okay. And then you have these, which... Calathea sandriana ornata. Yes. Is it a variation of sandriana ornata? I don't even know how it is now, but... I think there's a couple variations mm -hmm. on sandriana. Now, but... these are just still pretty small, so are you, you're growing these out, I'm mm -hmm. assuming. When would these actually be ready for sale? When they get to be a bigger size. Over here, I think I have some that would be right around the size this one's actually tagged to go out this okay. week. Bill says that it takes him around six months to get the Japortias and Calatheas to a shippable size from the quarter size liners he orders. And some of the anthuriums that he grows can actually take nine months to a year before they reach a saleable size. Bill has a variety of other Marantesi that he grows, ranging from new types of Japortia to some of the more coveted species not always easily found on the market. Additionally, they also have their very own patented prayer plant, Stromanthi stromantoides variation charlie, which has variegated yellow markings on the leaves. I feel like these uh, have less green in them. Yes. Like that one has a little bit more green over there, but yeah. these are very... When you're splitting it, you occasionally get one that will revert back to its uh, species form, which is yeah. plain green. Hmm. And the great thing about this is it has a beautiful orange flower in the early spring. Ooh. That's nice. Mine's never flowered yet, but I have big, it, it gets big leaves. Yeah. Yeah. For us, it's January until about April. Okay. It'll flower. Okay. It likes the cooler temperatures to start flowering. So should you give it like a cooler temperature at night or just like cooler temperature during like a Nighttime temperature is usually okay. what causes uh, flowers. Okay. Well, let's go see some more of your, uh, of your facilities. This house has um, some anthuriums in it, and most of these come a long way because they come from Holland, from Anthura. 
Silver Chrome Gardens gets most of their Anthurium varieties from Anthura in Holland, a highly automated facility specializing in both Anthuriums and orchids, which was the subject of earlier episodes on Plant One On Me. And it was so fascinating to see the automation, which is like a little bit different from here because this is a, a is much more hands-on, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's less, uh, it, you have like, I mean, fertigation systems and things like that, but um, very different from <laughs> that neck of the woods. It is because uh, labor is a lot cheaper in this country than it right. is over there. Right. How do you decide which ones that you'd like to grow out here? Uh, we rely on our suppliers to give us idea of what will work in our temperatures. Down here we have uh, very hot summers and we don't get very much nighttime cold temperature, which is what anthuriums really love. Mm. They like humidity, but they like it cooler than we can supply down here. So we really need specific varieties that will do well down here for us. Right, and you were telling me before that they are typically found in a little bit more like cloud forest locations. Yes, the original species um, in South America are from cloud forest areas in the jungles where they're higher up in elevation. They have um, nighttime temperatures that cool down. In daytime, you have lots of cloud cover from uh, the, the mist, the humidity, which is basically like a constant cloud cover over there. And with that, you get prettier flowers, prettier foliage, all the things that you, you normally see on anthuriums. In the summertime down here, they lose about two shades of color on the flower. The leaves sort of drop a little bit color too. Mm -hmm. So we really have to push the varieties that do well in heat. And how long does it actually take you to test a specific variety here? Is it like a season or so, or? Well, basically we, we get about 250 plants from the lab. We take them out. We have to make sure that we get them at a certain time of year so we actually have them during our summer. Hmm. We want to know how they're going to do with the worst time of year, not the best. Yeah. Because if you grow something during the best and it looks great and then you order it and you don't realize that, hey, in the wintertime it's great, but the summertime it's not so much. Right. So we grow them out from there. We see how they do during our summer. If they do great, then we reorder for the next year. Okay. So it takes a long time to figure out what we got to do, what, how we're going to, which varieties we're going to take, which varieties we're going to skip. Yeah, and, and so I think I, I really love putting this into perspective for a lot of people, especially for those of us who actually like to grow plants indoors, because if we rewind back and we go to Anthura again, they were sharing with us that sometimes it takes up to 10 years to actually find the perfect quality orchid or Anthurium, because that's what they grow out. and. That's mind boggling to me because they're like hand selecting and kind of selecting like the best ones. Maybe it's for the best color or the best foliage, or maybe it keeps its bracts and inflorescence a lot longer. Who knows what they're selecting for, but it takes almost a decade or can take a decade. Then you are testing them out in your climate, which maybe for, you know, six months, nine months, whatever it is. And then you actually have to grow out the liners or the small plugs, so they're small plants, in order to be able to get them to a size for sale, which could take... It's basically months, from when months. they come in from Anthura, it yeah. takes about nine months to a year to finish an Anthurium properly. Wow. So I think that gives, I think, somebody like me or somebody who is buying houseplants that much more of an appreciation because that is so much of what we don't see before we actually go to a garden center and pick up a plant. Yeah, also we do our own breeding work here, so we totally commiserate with what they have to do. It takes years and years and years to get a hybrid that you like mm. and that you'd want to put into tissue culture, mm. which is the same thing they go through. Yeah, wow, fascinating. So much more appreciation. I kind of bow down to you. <laughs> Come on, dog. And then is this uh, Prince of Orange, or which one is this? That's Macaulay's Finale. Okay. Uh, Prince of Orange does not like us. So it's uh, hard to grow. Is it just because of the heat, or you you're not quite sure? You can't it doesn't like our it. greenhouses. It gets lots of bacterial rot on the, on the leaves. Okay. Where the Macaulay's Finale and the Moonlight uh, right. don't have the same problems that Prince of Orange does. And then this is the Moonlight, right? Moonlight. Yeah, that's our number one selling plant. Is it really? Yeah, we yeah. sell a lot to casinos, large mass plantings, um, and big 
malls and places like that because it grows extremely well in low, low light situations. Interesting. And it has this kind of like brightness to it. It's almost like a neon green mm -hmm. with the new, the new foliage coming Yeah, it, it really brightens up a dark area when you're right. using it. Right. And I guess like low light but brightens it up with the, uh, with the foliage mm -hmm. is like a perfect combination. Daisy got her pot to play with. She <laughs> picks one every day that she, she likes to tear up and she'll run around like it's her precious. Oh my goodness. Now this is interesting if we could just stop here. So this is what, uh, you know, some of the liners would look like, right? Or the little plugs? Yeah, this yeah. we get in from the lab and this is what they look like. Mm -hmm. And then we'll put, um, depending on the plant, between one and three plants in a pot, a okay. six inch pot, and we'll grow them out from there. And then those are your six inch pots right there. Yes, yeah. those are about to be planted. Okay. And then from here, that would probably take, you said somewhere between... Uh, moonlight is a little bit faster than an anthurium. So that is about six months, mm -hmm. finish it. Okay, it's neat to see it in progress. So are these ones that you already have orders for or that you know you're gonna have orders for or? The Moonlight, it's very popular yeah. with uh, interior scapers. So we have lots of pre-orders for that one. Macaulay's Finale is uh, more of a, I need one box here, one box there, one box here. So it's small orders, but lots of them. Now that I had a sense as to how long it actually takes Bill to grow out certain varieties of plants, I asked him how he can predict what growers and consumers will actually want. Our biggest problem is it's a lot of guessing. Mm. You always guess at what the consumer is going to want because you have no idea what's going to be popular a year from now. And that's what you're basically doing. All a grower is doing is speculating on what he thinks he'll be able to sell in a year. Right. Some nurseries have quick turnaround, some products in and out, in and out, in and out. And they're able to say, hey, I'm selling more of this. I can plant more of this. Mm -hmm. Where we, we grow a little bit slower growing plants, like aeroids mostly are pretty slow. So for me to turn around and say, I need to print more of this, it takes me a year to get it up into production. Right. And sometimes trends move faster than that. Yeah, <laughs> trends move way faster than we can possibly move. And I don't right. think people understand that. Yeah. They think, oh, it's popular. You should be growing more of it. Yeah, <laughs> I will be growing more of it, but that'll be available in a year. Yeah, right on. I think um, doing videos such as these, I mean, really help because people begin to, you don't, you don't appreciate what you don't know. And, um, and I think that that's one of the things that we're finding out is, you know, to, in order to be able to get that plant to a level to make it available all over the United States or all over the world, that it takes a number of you guys in order to be able to start producing them and, and a uh, undisclosed amount of time depending on the, the plant. And in the case of aeroids, as you were mentioning, they're a little bit of a slower grower. It's not as maybe as quick as like say a peperomia. Yes. Is this something that you could share? Uh, the fill in and Birkin? Birkin? Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> that's a really popular plant right now. Yeah, those liners are coming out of a uh, Chinese laboratory. Yeah. I had to get those in on a whim. Yeah. Because they have a minimum order size to bring them over for China. Okay. It's, it's a little bit more expensive yeah. to bring something in from Asia. And you have to see, so, and, you, and you're not even quite sure whether they're going to grow well here. I, I was pretty sure I could grow them. Yeah. Um, my issue was, would I be able to sell them for what the price that I have to get? Get in order to be able to make it worthwhile, right. Because here, uh, I can't mark up stuff like a garden center can mark it up right. because my customers still have to resell it. Right, exactly. Do they just start to develop? Like In the this? juvenile form, yeah. uh, Birkin is a plain green leaf. Interesting. It doesn't actually get the white until it gets to be a more adult sized leaf. That is fascinating. I mean, I, I shouldn't be that fascinated by it because I know that's true and sometimes there's plants that start with the stripes, yeah. They and then start with also, stripes and then they go plain yeah. green. Because the Calathea sandariana or not, right, or not when it gets to be six, seven feet tall, it's, it's green. It's plain right? green. Yeah. It's just plain yeah. green paddle leaf. Kind of like the same thing with Circestus mirabilis. I think it starts out as like a really, you know, kind of beautiful white striations on it and then all of a sudden it goes yes. green. <laughs> Well, this is, a, this is a really hot one right now. I, I start to see it come out here and there on the internet and people are paying primo dollars for it. So hats off to you for jumping in on that one. <laughs> 
alocasias here mm -hmm. and your anthuriums, which... In alocasias, uh, we usually grow in a six inch pot, but if we have something left over, we'll put it into a 10 inch pot. Is this technically alocasia poly? That's one of ours, yes. Okay. We patented that one many, many, many years ago. It was uh, selected out of um, a regular uh, group of Amazonica. Yeah. Um, because it was shorter, squatter, we thought it was a better plant. And so uh, we are able to get something that actually was, for a while, the number one most uh, popular plant in interior scapers in the world. Well, I have a question for you because when I bring my Amazonicas in, or polys, I battle with spider mites. And that's in the Northeast. So I don't know how if people battle with the same situation in different necks of the woods, but do you have any kind of feedback on it? Spider mites, the number one thing in the entire world that attracts them is stress. Mm -hmm. If you stress your plant out, it's gonna get spider mites. It exudes all sorts of pheromones. It says, help me, help me, help me. <laughs> Kill me. And, and then Kill the spider now. mites know that that smell is. Right. And they go right to it. Right. So if you change the environment mm -hmm. that your plant's in, you like bring it from outside to inside, uh, you do something like that, then you're always going to get some sort of stress re uh, reaction mm -hmm. to it. Once that stress reaction is, you get spider mites. You get all sorts of problems from there. So the best thing to do is try not to stress your plant out. And this is e easier uh, done if you have like a greenhouse like yeah. this, this, but if it comes to it, you're just going to have to use manufacturers recommended sprays, yeah. oils, different things. Is there a way to acclimatize the plant from coming in like bathing in optimum conditions like a greenhouse like this and then transitioning it into your home environment in a way that is more acceptable? Sitting it next to a humidifier, I mean, is there... Uh, on the alocasias, it's going to be a big shock coming mm -hmm. from 85, 90 degrees summer temperatures down here yeah. into a New York City apartment. Do you think Do you think it's better to get them in the uh, January, February months when it's a little cooler here? Or is, does that not make a difference? Um, most alocasias basically stop growing in the wintertime. Hmm. They either go dormant or they just stop new leaf production. So you're sort of freezing them in time. So if you're able to buy them in the wintertime and keep them alive in the transport truck and on the loading dock of that facility, yes, you probably will get them in suspended animation in the okay. wintertime. Okay. But in the, in the springtime, when they start popping again, you'll, you'll get them to be grow out strong because they'll have all that winter stored up energy. Very good to know. Wow, so you're growing out some gloriosums. Philodendron gloriosum. Yeah. Some more anthuriums. More anthuriums from Holland and some, some uh, laboratories in the US as well. <laughs> we grow more varieties of anthurium than probably anyone in the either. United States. Oh, what is this one? That's anthurium rainbow champion from okay. Anthura. Okay, yeah, because I, I, I just got this one, oh, I don't even know, like seven or eight months ago. And I fell in love with it because the bracts are so big. And one was like flopping over like my chicken's comb and I just, I fell in love with it. And the leaves are also really nice too. So this is a summertime bloom. Mm -hmm. This is a wintertime bloom. We're already starting oh. to get the wintertime uh, night temperatures. Yeah. So it's actually changing the color of the bloom. Wow, and it looks actually much more closer to the, to the leaf. To the, uh, this is the plant the actually leaf. trying to get chlorophyll in its flower. Wow because it notices the, t the days are getting shorter. All right, so this is basically anthurium on top of anthurium on top of anthurium. Yeah, we do a few skin dapses on the aisle. Oh, yes, of course. And then I saw some philodendron brantianums right here too, yeah. right? And some sodoroi. Oh, nice. Those are popular. Yes. That actually went for a pretty penny at the Aroid show. Yeah, that's one I give them. Yeah. And then this obviously stands out. <laughs> anthurium Big Bill. That was my first hybrid I ever made. And they're both big bills. Yes. I kept two for breeding purposes because you always want to make sure you have pollen when you have a fertile flower. So 
You have an incredible collection here, which we're not going to get to see in this episode, but hopefully after we go through your commercial operation, you'll take us to of course. your, your private collection, mm -hmm. which this will give you a little bit of a tease of what's, the, what's to come in the private collection. Well, this one's like a candy stripe color. That is an anthura variety called Safari. That's, That's an older variety, but they have uh, newer varieties that have uh, the stripes as well. They have not released into the U.S. yet. Okay. They have released in Holland. Did it do well for you here when you were growing it out before, the older variety? It's more of a cut flower variety oh, rather than a pot plant variety. Okay. So we grew it as a cut flower. Mm -hmm. um, they were pretty popular yeah. when we did grow it, but now they have an actual pot variety. I don't remember the name at this time since okay. they won't allow me to grow it yet. Okay. I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm praying. <laughs> Fingers crossed. So these have some more of your anthuriums here? Yes, this is an area where we keep a lot of our bird nest anthuriums. This variety is a uh, big red bird. Hmm. Uh, it's one of our tissue cultured uh, hybrids that we made. Um, in the shade, it'll have a red vein, but in the full sun, or well, partial sun, it'll have um, a whole, full, whole leaf will be red. And do you have any tips for people who are growing bird's nests and theriums in their, their home? Because that is something that I, th and I know you're known for. Uh, they're almost indestructible. It's actually a really great plant for inside your house. Yeah. I had um, one of my doctors and I put um, a bird nest fruffles yeah. in his office and it was there for about 15 years and he never did anything to it and looked as beautiful as the day I put it in for 15 years. It didn't really grow much but he didn't really have any lights in the area, it's yeah. a doctor's office, there's no windows. Yeah. So it, 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 it survived, it just, you know, it looked great. Do people put them in their landscape out here or is yes, it Yes, you can do that down here, you okay. can have them in your landscape. Okay, but for those of us up north we have to you have subscribe to, to the house plant. <laughs> yes. Below 32 degrees, you're probably going to get some leaf drop. Mm. If it freezes, you're, you're going to kill it. Yeah. Well, a lot of um, bird's nest anthuriums have like really meaty roots. Oh, yeah. So uh, what's, the, what's the best way for caring for your plant indoors? Yes, you can see here some of it's the meaty It's like an roots. orchid. Yes. Yeah, you can either... Um, Put them in a basket and have them hanging. Mm -hmm. um, you can put them in a big clay pot. If they're worried that the hydraulic pressure of the roots will actually bust out clay pots. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people use concrete pots because they're a little bit more sturdy. Mm. Uh, plastic they'll bust out of. They'll eventually push out and to crack the plastic down the seam of it. Yeah, I've actually seen them in garden centers and plant shops pushing out of their plastic oh, yeah. pots, yeah. Uh -huh. it'll, start, it'll start to bubble, yeah. and it'll look like the Incredible Hulk about to bust out of its shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I usually have to cut them out of the pot, so you know, when they're, when they're in that situation. Uh, the best thing to do is just is take it and just yeah. smack it on your knee, and it'll go pop. <laughs> okay. Once it has all that pressure on it. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, just to, to know that, that that amount of pressure happens actually in the rhizosphere, in the root zone, that's gonna be, that's like tremendous. You know, your plant is literally the Eventually, incredible Eventually after about, I'd say about two years in this size pot, mm -hmm. there won't be any soil left. The mm -hmm. plant will have cannibalized all the soil and you'll only find roots in there. So are you um, advocating for planting in a, like a much larger pot or is it just the next size up or, you know, cause you're, what I'm getting is that these roots actually grow, you know, fairly fast and are very strong. Oh yeah, they're very strong. Yeah. Um, you can keep them under planted and they'll do fine. Mm -hmm. If you put them in a really big pot, mm -hmm. they'll love the new root zone. But basically what they do is they go out mm -hmm. to the edges of it and I then see. go down and under. Okay. So they want to find the, the outer limits onto. of their ability. Because yeah. a lot of these in the wild are grown in, inside of trees. Yeah. You know, wherever the birds drop the seeds, that's where they're growing. So you'll see a lot of them growing off the side or something like this. Yeah. So that's what they really want to do. They want to attach onto the side of a tree, attach onto a rock. And when if you ever go to South America and see where they're actually growing in their environment, on the side of logs, stuff like that. And I have a question because um, when you're saying that's similar to orchids and you know a lot of orchids actually want to grip onto 
rocks or terracotta. And there's some folks who have this, you know, should I grow them in a terracotta pot or not? Because terracotta has like more of a wicking ability. Sometimes the calcium deposits will build up. Mm -hmm. Could they potentially hurt the roots in any kind of way where maybe there's calcium buildup or anything along that lines? No, these okay. things are, are super strong. Okay. Uh, you, won't, you won't have a problem with that. Okay, perfect. I had one customer um, who had a, bought a bunch for a landscape in Key West and they had a hurricane there and they were under seven days straight of seawater in the yard. And when the seawater sea receded, the only thing left were the anthuriums a lot of the natives died, but the anthuriums were perfectly fine being under seawater for seven days. Wow. Okay, so for anybody who wants a really indestructible house plant, and when I've ever said Zamiococcus zamiofolia, big red bird hybrid might actually be up there. <laughs> most, of the, most of the bird nest varieties yeah. are extremely hardy. I have some landscape allocations yeah. that you'll be amazed with oh, yeah. sure. their size. Yeah. Borneo giant. Oh, this is huge. They'll get about 14 feet tall. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so you can imagine they're probably up to the roof when they get that. And they're growing in such small pots for They like to be under potted. Wow. Alocasias like uh, uh, good humidity, but they don't like a whole lot of water. I mean, so it's they like- It's so impressive that like, their, their pot is so tiny. My favorite alocasia is the lutea. With the yellow. I love the yellow leaves. They're so beautiful. It reminds me of a Swiss chard mm -hmm. in a way. Uh-huh. Yeah. Exactly. Same color. Yeah. We also do some xanthosoma. We have the lime zinger and the violaceum. Oh, nice. And those do really well in the landscape down here. And again, this has like that really beautiful shock of neon green color. So it, it looks like it would probably pop out of the landscape environment. Uh, this is one of the hybrids um, they were released by Agristarch, which is another of our labs. Yeah. Um, called Sumo. It has that giant purple leaf. Yeah. Nice, good coloration on it. Yeah, beautiful. Reminds me of kind of like um, more decorative kale. <laughs> we have like a lot of edible landscape plants that end up becoming more landscape than edibles in the Northeast. Is the Alocasia black stem, which has the beautiful black petioles. Oh, yeah. Oh, and look at the leaf coming right up out of there. It has real good contrast on the back of the leaf. Yeah. And this is for, you know, creating like really dramatic landscapes because mm -hmm. you can't go wrong with these. And if they, this doesn't get up to 14 feet tall though, does no, it? No, this is about an eight footer. Okay. So really you're doing a lot of house plants, but you also do a lot of landscape plants, especially for the, the Florida market, for instance. Yeah, and the alocasias down here, they're great for landscaping. They use them plantings in, in different outdoor restaurants and um, containers, containers, container gardening. Uh, beautiful. Yeah. Well, Bill, this is amazing to just see your operation. In you know, I've seen you in the shows, but it's so neat to actually see your operation working here and what you're growing next, which is super cool. And I cannot wait to go see your private collection. What information from Bill surprised you about running a commercial plant operation in the United States? Tell me in the comments below. If you're digging the episodes on this channel, then tap on the subscribe and notifications button so you can support the channel and get new episodes delivered to your inbox daily. And if you'd like to explore the softer skills of plant care and our connections to them, then check out How to Make a Plant Love You, which has released in both English and Dutch with more translations on the way. Finally, if you'd like to gain more tactical skills to houseplant care and maintenance, then check out the Houseplant Masterclass at houseplantmasterclass.com. <laughs>